So we have a session. Uh, it's a sponsored session by CIPLA in which we are trying to deal with uh, problems for general ophthalmologists and simple solutions. So uh, right in the big. Uh, good afternoon. Can I have my slides, please? Sign, sign already. Okay. Uh, I have been assigned a topic which is uh, nothing short of a full session. Yes. But I have tried it to. Takes around one day. <laughs> I, I so try to finish in fifteen that minutes. That is the art of a teacher, uh, teacher and a political person. <laughs> you can put it into 15 minutes. I have no Or option. you can just give the topics and let us ask them the questions. <laughs> let us see if they are interested and they will ask you what they want to ask you. You can start the timer now rather than having started earlier. So diagnostic tests, there are many. They are increasing every day. The purpose of treatment is what? The purpose of these diagnosis tests, not of treatment, but the purpose of diagnosis tests is to reduce the number of glaucoma suspects. However, many of these investigations are doing just the other way around. They are adding to the number of glaucoma suspects, which is a negative part of this. But we will not go into the negative part, we will go into the positive part. And we will cover intraocular pressure, angle evaluation, disc evaluation and perimetry because OCT is there in the next talk. The diagnosis uh, uh, of glaucoma is based basically on the clinical with slit lamp examination, basically which is used to rule out secondary glaucomas in the fundus examination which has to be 3D uh, without any doubt and intraocular pressure is no doubt uh, is the first and foremost requirement and gonioscopy to differentiate between angle closure and open angle and sometimes to find the cause of the secondary glaucoma. The investigations are done structural or functional Fun structural tests are fundus photo and imaging. However, the final initial diagnosis is always, always clinical. Investigations are either supportive or they are useful for assessment of progression. What is the hallmark of glaucoma diagnosis? Asymmetry and when you can't show asymmetry, progression. It's not only in the disc that asymmetry is important, but there has to be corresponding asymmetry in the intraocular pressure, imaging and fields wherever possible. For example, in case uh, an eye with intraocular pressure, one eye has 12, other eye has 18 and you are suspicious of glaucoma in the disc in 12, the answer is no, it's not glaucoma. So this is uh, my video on tonometry, which is world's maximally seen video with 1.5 lakh views on this topic. In case anybody quickly wants to take a picture, can take a picture of this. This is based only on Goldman Appalachian tonometry mainly. So you all know that tonometry is basically indentation and appalachian. However, there are other types now also included in this. There are many, many instruments which are coming up, which are shown out here and uh, they can be used. Some have some specific indications. The appalachian tonometry, it's a simple flattening. Fixed force tonometers are no more in use. They were popular in Russia. And now we use only the fixed area tonometers and the standard is, uh, gold standard is Goldman Appalachian tonometry. Indentation tonometry, everybody is aware of this, but they are very, you know, uh, problematic when there is core, uh, rigidity is high or very low. So this is what Goldman Appalachian tonometer is. I'm sure all of you have seen. And uh, this is the, uh, this is the view inside the tonometer. The principle is that there is a plastic biprism which optically splits the tear film into two semicircles. The edge of corneal contact is visible after placing fluorescein in, into the tear film and viewing with cobalt blue light. So this is uh, the Myers understanding of which is very important and this is based on centration, thickness of fluorescein ring and application force and you can go through my video to know the details. So this is what the correct alignment should look like. The two uh, semicircles should interlock with equal size and width of the mire should be one tenth of the total diameter. Pachymetry is now an essential part of the uh, of this intraocular pressure workup. 
and it measures the thickness of cornea and the cornea thickness has the potential to influence eye pressure so that's why it's now part of the iop checkup uh, interpretation of intraocular pressure the normal range is considered to be 10 to 20 but it's not a hard and fast rule rise from 10 to 15 may mean glaucoma if a person has baseline 10 may it may rise to 15 and be glaucoma and it should be viewed in the light of central cornea thickness as it also influences the Meyer IOP. Asymmetry, as I said, is most important and diurnal variation is not to be given the back seat. In case we do diurnal variation, many of the patients who have been diagnosed as normal tension glaucoma will be diagnosed as primary open angle glaucoma. And not only that, we have to assess the fall of the intraocular pressure uh, with the drugs because this is the only modifiable risk factor. Then the gonioscopy, where should we do? Everyone should undergo this, whosoever is being worked up for glaucoma. No attempt should be made to treat glaucoma without, without gonioscopy. All the established glaucomas, family history of glaucoma, raised IOP, trauma, pigment dispersion, pseudo exfoliation, retinal vascular occlusions, all these patients require gonioscopy. However, raised intraocular pressure is the most important. So clues during slit lamp evaluation to the angle closure glaucoma, the glaucoma frequency or the pupillary rough atrophy can be subtle signs. And this is showing pigment dispersion, Krukenberg spindle and this is showing pseudo exfoliation material on the margins of the uh, pupil. So these are old cases suggestive of secondary glaucoma and iris new vessels can also be seen. One Herix test may be used for screening in busy OPD and you can see plateau iris configuration sometimes you are able to make it out. But it needs gonioscopic confirmation. The technique explain the procedure to the patient, room should be darkened, slit lamp evaluation of the cornea should be done, topical anesthesia to be used, two one mirror gonior lens needs to be filled with coupling fluid whereas 5M does not require only tears to do the work. Please avoid three mirror gonioscope for this purpose. Patient should maintain the primary gaze, low but adequate illumination with small beam to assess the occludability. But when you want to understand the details of the angle, then you have to use more light and more width. Uh, this is showing 3M, 3 mirror gonioscopy insertion because that's the most difficult. Otherwise, it is not to be used practically. Uh, Manipulative gonioscopy is, gives you the over the hill view. You can know from the details by Dr. Ravi Thomas that what all this is. They, they, he gives details. This was, I think, published in 2000, 2001, somewhere in IGO. Move the gaze towards the mirror, tilt the lens towards the quadrant, ask the patient to look towards the mirror. So that is what gives you over the hill view because the iris is convex that is acting like a hill and then you can go peep inside the angle. This is how it is done. Indentation gonioscopy is possible only with 4 mirror gonioscope. It differentiates between the appositional and synechial closure. So this is what it is. It is shown diagrammatically out here. This cannot be done with the mirrors in which the contact area is more than the size of the cornea. So this is how it is opening the angle. Uh, however, this is a problem with 4 mirror gonioscopy. Desmet's membranes, Desmet's folds sometimes they come up and uh, reduce the vis vis uh, visibility of this. So, all structures are visible and correct anatomy is preserved. If it is so, then trabecular pigmentation has to be assessed. If it is normal, then this is a case we are dealing with primary open angle glaucoma or, or ocular hypertension or the patient is normal. When the trabecular pigmentation is abnormal, sampleasis line is there, we are dealing with uh, pseudo exfoliation and when there is hyperpigmentation we are dealing with pigment dispersion syndrome and uh, when all structures are not visible then if there is poor differentiation and anterior insertion of iris and prominent iris processes then it is congenital or juvenile glaucoma in case there is angle recession iris disinsertion or ciliary body cleft then we are dealing with a case of trauma and peripheral anterior synechia closed angle new vessels then we are dealing with uveitic or neovascular glaucoma A positional versus synechial closure. This is how it looks like. Uh, the upper one sh is showing narrow angle and this is opening. The one on your left is opening up uh, on compression whereas the right is not opening because that is a synechial closure.
so grading schemes are many however uh, for documentation purpose you can simply note down which structures were visible and you can see in the progression over the years you can do because the lens becomes thicker and the air angles become narrower over a period of time and you can always see the structures visible pigmentation convexity of the iris presence of peripheral anterior synechia or any other abnormality like neovascles and so on all these things need to be noted down the clinical examples this is open versus closed angle this is plateau iris double hump sign these are trabecular meshwork pigmentation amount of pigmentation is varying in these two cases this is non pigmented and the other one is more pigmented ciliary body band uh, you can see out here uh, see this this junction this ciliary band bond band is wider here so what are we dealing with this is angle recession and on the other side there was some synechia and small synechia out here and ciliary body band visible in the other area it is generally taught that a person with ciliary body band uh, visible cannot have angle closure they can have angle closure and it can even be primary angle closure or it can be because of uveitis secondary glaucoma so this is showing multiple iris processes and this is showing new vascularization of the iris these normal vessels can be the size and the shape and the direction is different next is the ultrasound biomicroscopy the high frequency ultrasound is used and this is how it is done in lying down position it redefines and strengthen our concept complementary to our clinical evaluation imaging is elusive of diaphragm and ciliary body complex can be visible because the things are certain things because uh, ubm is is ultrasound based and oct is light based so anything be behind the iris cannot be seen by uh, uh, oct and ubm can see that so the clinical the normal anatomy that's a scler uh, scleral spur and this is showing the open angle and a narrow angle pupillary block can be best assessed by varying the light intensity uh, in with ubm the pre pi and post pi the post pi here is showing the opening of the angle and this is showing pigment dispersion and this is showing zonular iris contact uh, out here and this is rubbing and causing pigment dispersion and traumatic cyclodialysis and this is what is visible out here a uh, post trap shallow ac the causes can be sometimes it is um, not possible to find out although in post operative ac doing ubm is extremely difficult but yes it is possible to find out the cause in case you are able to do it in malignant glaucoma also you can find uh, there are specific findings in the uh, ubm the ciliary body gets rotated anteriorly and the ac is very very shallow this is after the treatment and this is uh, topramate uh, drug induced bilateral angle closure showing a regular shallowing of the anterior chamber Sh shown the same thing shown on ubm and this is showing this is showing out here the ciliary choroidal effusion that happens in these cases that optic disc evaluation the final initial diagnosis as i said is always clinical based on the disc assessment and uh, Uh, it is the most vital test as far as the definition of glaucoma as it stands today is concerned so when is a disc glaucomatous notch or rim loss with corresponding defect and in case there is progression progressive structural change as i said the hallmark is asymmetry and progression so if you cannot find anything else then progression has to be looked for and a disc hemorrhage is again suggestive of presence of glaucoma so this is showing a retinal nerve fiber layer defect out here which you can see this is between these two arrows there is rnfl defect and this is showing notching and this is showing other hard signs bionating and uh, uh, the bearing of the circumlinear vessels this is circumlinear vessel the cuff has gone from this size to this size so this is a case of glaucoma so this is advanced glaucoma showing laminar dot sign this 
and the discs can you know vary in size so that also has to be a very very important consideration a cup disc ratio of 1.2 a cup a cup disc size of 1.2 should not have any any a, a cup in case even 0.2 cup is present it is likely to be glaucoma whereas in a disc of 2.5 mm size a 0.8 cup may not be glaucoma so various size of discs can be normal like a person of 5 feet and 6 feet they are both normal however the pallor the diffuse pallor is always suggestive of some other neurological problem in addition to glaucoma if glaucoma is present however there are huge variation in the observers when they are examining the glaucomatous cup so you have to be very careful in doing this so you have to be very very well trained in looking at the disc so you look at the 1000 normal disc to be able to you know diagnose really glaucoma however pallor is very specific of non glaucoma so then there can be certain challenges the mimickers of glaucoma tilted disc glaucoma drusens and then the last is perimetry i'll just take one or two minutes i do not know how much is the time left uh, perimetry is the measurement of the function it the gold standard is this is a gold standard test nowadays uh, because this is the functional loss which is most important we need to treat the functional loss this is one minute or the last its time is up finished interpretation i think these are various things i'll not take uh, much time so these are the various areas again there is a article in IGO by Ravi Thomas which gives very very good details of this in early of this century so this VFI is a new addition but you must ensure that you are dealing with the right patient the identification data then there are various strategies CETA standard is 24-2 CETA standard is the standard test for glaucoma nowadays so these are various criteria which you can go through the books so guidelines for the visual field examination learning phase is there in the perimetry most pronounced between first and the second visual field examination please correlate it co clinically because there can be artifacts lead artifacts which can be removed by taping the tip up this is a, a artifact due to rim defect this is peripheral in the lower part and then pupil if small can give you concentric constriction and then wrong correction if it is placed again can give then clover leaf if the patient gets tired and feeling sleepy so what is this is this glaucoma is it fulfilling the Anderson criteria the answer is yes but the answer to the first question is no because it's a case of coloboma so the take home message is correlate all findings of history and detailed examination final diagnosis is always clinical treat human beings and not intraocular pressure or treatment or the visual fields and human beings have felt needs they have financial constraints they have symptoms and side effects they have social bindings and limitations and not the least psychological effects the psychological effects of glaucoma diagnosis or even that of glaucoma suspect can be immense and can significantly reduce the quality of life so diagnose very carefully thank you so much <laughs> Thank you, Manav. I think that was wonderfully done because you really emphasized the major parts. And the most important what he said was that never, please never take one or two diagnoses. Varna, every day we keep seeing pressure I wa, das saal se uska glaucoma chal hai. So please be very, very careful because you have to correlate if the pressure is high, is the cornea thick? And especially in children, every day we'll get children like he has shown a video also taking a pressure is an art it is not a science the moment they blink a little bit more you will get 40 pressure so it is you cannot just take that pressure at all so you have to really see everything else and if they correlate yes there is a notch over there where there is a field defect like he very classically showed because once you label as glaucoma like he rightly showed in his last slide so beautifully that uh, somebody's life may be totally keep, shattered. Keep this slide on, please, for a few seconds. And what I what we have seen is the, the slide, the last slide, the take home message. The slide read in an OCT. I have seen people. The patient comes to me and says, "Sir, he is saying the doctor is saying I'll go blind." What the hell? Well, please, for God's sake, never utter that word blind. If he goes blind, then what the hell are you there sitting for? 
so please be very very careful that word is as a matter of fact the last thing when the patient leaves your chamber is that i will take care of you you will never go blind even if it is a lie you bloody tell them doesn't matter it will make them live their lives okay otherwise you are shattering their life in one second so very nicely and very rightly said sir manadeep and we'll take all the questions in the end if there's some burning question you can please ask him uh, dr harsh sir we we routinely see patients children with syndromes and with pressures 30 they don't progress they never progress because their coronary thickness is 700 so this is very very common especially in, in syndromic children so so we need not be very you know worried about those things and we need not to put psychological pressure on the patient as dr harsh rightly said so we are treating human beings please remember we are treating human beings thank you manav and now we have uh, dr devang who is very well known in glaucoma circles an assistant professor of ophthalmology in rp center aims and i actually never knew that she also does trabismology and neuro ophthalmology because strabismus is one thing i never understood so you must be brilliant on that and she will tell us about oct diagnosis and management of glaucoma so this is please clarify for everybody what in oct is important and few questions i also have from you is that that central graph that we get saying cd ratio and all that because i never see that it correlates with the actual cd ratio what we see in the oct and what happens over there so please tell us what is red disease what is green disease what should the people really when they pick up a oct what should they look at can they uh, see progression from there or is it not to be seen from oct in which stages oct is to be done not that everybody who comes you just write oct now if you have a 10 degree field what are you going to do an oct for so uh, i don't want to finish the lecture before devang starts <laughs> please go ahead thank you sir for the kind introduction uh, i think i'll uh, do justice to whatever questions you have asked for and whatever i don't answer i sir you are right there so that won't be a problem at the outset i would like to thank aios for this opportunity and i would like to uh, greet uh, uh, good afternoon to all the respected faculty on the dais and everyone here so coming on to oct the first thing comes to our mind is what is the need for oct so as we all know that a high level of training and skill is required to take and interpret fundus photos and it is not uh, you know available everywhere but now oct is more randomly available and more so it gives a very quick and objective scan uh, of the optic nerve retinal nerve fibular as well as the ganglion cell analysis which is helpful in early diagnosis and monitoring progression and helping us halter or prevent pre uh, leading to a, the irreversible blindness for which all of us are working towards too so as we all know that till now it has been shown that both the retinal nerve fiber layer loss it precedes the visual field loss as well as it precedes the disc changes so oct is measuring both the disc as well as the retinal nerve fiber layer so it is a very sensitive tool and uh, the new kid on block right now is the ganglion cell layer so since the retinal nerve fiber layer is only composed of axons assessing the retinal ganglion cell itself may be a more direct way to measure the ocular damage due to glaucoma rather than just the measurement of the circumpapillary retinal fiber layer so this is basically an adjunct to what we have so this is how the printout looks like this is the oct printout so if you look at the top at the top we have the patient data so like a routine visual field we have the patient data we just correlate that it's the same patient the age is entered well so at the top you have one important thing is the signal strength so the signal strength should be 6 and more if the oct has a poor signal strength which is less than 5 it should always be repeated or it should be taken with a pinch of salt because of the signal signal strengths are poor i will be discussing later there's a lot of artifacts which which you, which one should know before interpreting the data so after zone 1 we have the zone 2 here we have all the da datas that is uh, we have all the uh, uh, data in terms of ratios and averages like the average uh, retinal nerve fiber thickness the symmetry between both the discs the rim area the ra the average cup disc ratio the vertical cup disc ratio and cup volume 
Then in zone three is basically the test net overlap graph of the two eyes. The zone four is basically the red free photographs of the right and the left eye respectively. Zone five is the test net graph with the age match control. So basically when they show this with the age match control, there will be a color coded uh, graph and the green meaning that it is well with the normal limits, yellow is borderline and red is abnormal. So red doesn't mean glaucoma, it means that it is abnormal and there are thousand causes for uh, uh, the scan to be red. So uh, sixth is a percentile in the clockwise sector and seven is a more sensitive, it is more in a clockwise rather than a quadrantic sector. So if you look onto the ganglion cell printout, it looks si similar. We have the average RNFL thickness maps at the top, then we have the sectoral maps and in between we have the average ganglion cell layer thickness. So if I take if you if I take you through a case, so this was a 26 year old female who was re, who was referred from our least, refractive lab, and uh, she there when the uh, non contact tonometry was done, the pressures were nearly between 22 to 24. When we it came to the glaucoma clinic, the pressures were 18. However, the CCT the central corneal thickness was slightly on the lower side. She did have a family history of glaucoma, for which she was concerned about. And when we looked at the disc, we can clearly see that it is a myopic tilted disc. So the, the, here we wanted to do the OCT and C. So you, if you look at the retinal nerve fiber layer, there is a, inferiorly definitely there is thinning. And on the ganglion cell, you can see temporal and inferior, both thinning is there. And in the left eye, which apparently looked not that bad, there was ganglion cell changes. So this patient now has to be, and definitely the uh, visual field will not show any defect. So this patient needs to be followed up, needs to be counseled and regularly followed up. So this was a sec uh, second uh, patient who was a 62-year-old professional who had again come to a, uh, the OPD for a routine checkup. Again in the OPD on the non-contact, the pressures were like 21, 22. And uh, the resident had brought saying that there is a, a glaucoma because of the large cup disc ratio. So if you look at the IOP on application uh, tonometry, it was nearly it was within normal limits. The CCT was also normal. So when you look at the disc, at a first glance, when the patient was not dilated, the angles were open. Uh, this disc looks like a horizontally oval disc, vis a vis the other disc, which is more like a, a vertically oval disc. So, because of this asymmetry, it looks like there is an increased cup disc ratio. So, since he was a professional, we didn't want to give him a, a we uh, didn't want, we, uh, he was in a benefit of doubt, so we did an uh, RNFL OCT and it was coming to be normal. So, again, uh, OCT is a very good tool to tell the patient that now you are absolutely normal no need to be worry of. So there's another case where there's a frank asymmetry between the two discs, the angles were open and uh, in the right eye you can see a near total cupping, inferiorly you can see a disc hemorrhage as well. But the left eye, the patient is like my left eye is normal. So we are, when we, we, we do a, a field, there's a, uh, in the right eye we can see a, a corresponding field defect. And when we do a OCT, so we know that the right eye is abnormal, but the left eye, there is a def uh, on the OCT, there is an RNFL defect. And uh, we also did a young Leon cell to see that there is a temporal defect in the left eye. So this was the time when we actually caught hold of the patient and told him that this is the scan, you have to put your medicines regularly. Because the patient thinking that, you know, they don't know that the disease is bilateral, they'll put one medicine in the right eye and forget putting in the left eye. So this is how the scan is also important for teaching our patients. Then once we make a diagnosis of glaucoma, now because we all know that glaucoma is a chronic progressive disease, it definitely will progress. So we need to know how does it progress and the patients who are progressing, we have to you know, uh, change up, step up our management. We can't stick on to whatever the patient is using. So this is, uh, the OCT also gives us the advantage of doing a guided progression analysis. So this is how the printout looks like. So we need two baseline examinations. And uh, uh, then on the third examination, if there's any defect, which is change is noted only in one exam, it will show as a yellow, which is, means a borderline change. You need to follow up and subsequent uh, a scan again if sh it shows a sustained uh, uh, you know defect which is seen in red color it means that the patient has definitely progressed you have to change your management so this is another case wherein you can see if you look at the average uh, uh, th thickness map there's a near total cupping but if you look at the uh, OCT graph there is no change there's no it doesn't show any progression so what we have to remember is that 
there is a term known as floor effect which means that that a oct beyond a level that is beyond 40 or 50 microns the rnfl can never be zero because there are underlying uh, glial cells which are there so beyond this you have to use visual fields to show progression okay so you need to uh, in advanced cases you need to add visual field for the to note the progression of these patients so this is an interesting case of a of a patient of a uh, when he came to us it was an open angle and the the thing which was uh, very prominent was the left eye notching which was there so we went and did an oct and we followed up so as we are following up you can see that there is a definite progression so whatever medications we are using it has to be stepped up so we had to call the patient again and step up the management so myopia is another uh, ball game together because in myopia itself the there are pathology in the retina also apart from what uh, it shows and myopia is again a risk factor for glaucoma so there are this is a double disease uh, and it's very difficult to differentiate that the defect is because of the myopia or because of glaucoma so when a myopic patient comes we always do a oct so whatever oct we have we have to use that as a baseline and then we follow up the patient regularly so if you if you are seeing the left eye of this patient particularly we see that over the time over one year that this eye has progressed so whatever medication we are using we are using a single prostaglandin it is not sufficient now you have to step up even if the pressure is like 18 you have to step up and bring it down so one more important thing that i have told you that since it is a machine it will have artifacts so any machine will have artifacts which can be operator dependent that is like due to centration or patient is not dilated properly or poor signal strength or it can be patient dependent that the patient has media opacities he has any macular pathologies like vmt or erm or his pupil is not fully dilated and device dependent depending on the device whether it has a it's an old device it will have a slower acquisition speed or a database related so it has been shown that nearly one third to half of the scans does have uh, artifacts and these can be due to various reasons so i will just show you some clinical pictures so this was a patient uh, nearly like 45 year old open angle glaucoma so when she presented to us they took a scan and sent us this so if you look at the scan properly it has not been centered the top has been chopped up so when the patient it was repeated again it came as normal so again anything red you should not consider it to be glaucoma you have to see what, what is the cause for this red disease it should be clinically correlated second i have told you that there are many patient dependent factors so oct is compared against a normative database which is not available for patients who have pathological myopia who have any congenital disc abnormality who have very large or very small discs and pediatric age groups less than 18 years and patient do require pupillary dilatation for to get a good signal strength so this is an example wherein like the patient before cataract surgery the patient had uh, like a uh, he was a disc suspect and he wanted to see uh, the oct changes so if you look at the inferiorly you can see the cataractus changes and inferiorly there was de this defect and post cataract surgery this defect disappeared so this is definitely not because of the glaucoma it is because of the cortical opacities second is the green disease so what is this green disease so it occurs in patients who have normal global values like when you look at the uh, oct value it will be normal oh the slide is not working anybody from the av yeah i think it's uh, time to ring the bell please wake up everyone as well as the <laughs> screen <laughs> from the sleep mode so by the time you can just tell the green disease like that yeah so ba basically what green disease as it suggests that the scan will show green okay scan green lagega why does it show green even if there is an abnormality it is because it occurs in patients who have a normal global values such as an average anal thickness will become normal it will show normal but there will be focal defects to us focal defect wo focal defect miss ho rahe hain so if once are we so if they can show this picture i think from the picture they will come to know more nahi nahi upar se nahi dekh acha by the time they tell uh, one question should all patients undergo an oct uh, no. matlab obviously if they have got a new machine and they want to give the emi then it is different <laughs> but other than that ha, i don't think so all patient i i would i suggest that if you do a good clinical examination 
a good history, a good clinical examination, a good slit lamp bio microscopy, you can escape doing OCT in nearly 40-50% of the patients. OCT is only meant for patients where you know that there is a doubt, you know, especially myopic patients or some particular this thing where you want to Glaucoma and suspect. Yes, yes, yes. So glaucoma suspect also, sir. Same, what they same. refer to us, glaucoma suspects. Aapke paas bhi, sir. Fifty percent of them are just like a large, uh, physiological large disc. Large if you look at the neuroidal rim, if you look at clinically, I don't think so. It is required. Yeah, okay. Okay. So I will take upon from this. So this is how it is. You look at the average value. It shows like nearly seventy-six. <laughs> but yaha pe, inferiorly, if you see, there is a thinning clinically seen. But when you look at the RNFL thickness here, because there is a vitro like like uh, ERM type of a thing, here it is not showing defect right now. But definitely, when this ERM is peeled off, or later on, this will show, start showing defect. So these are the patients. You know that these are clinically showing you there is you know notching, there is some uh, clinical neuronal rim loss. These should these patients should be again treated immediately rather than wait and watch. So red disease is basically the OCT mistakenly identifies the area as abnormal. So anything abnormal, OCT will say it's a red, as because it is comparing with the normative database. So for example, this is like a type five iridofundal coloboma. So there is a thinning inferiorly. Okay, so that is why OCT is showing that this is abnormal. But you look at the disc, you correlate with the patient clinically. There will be no. you know no need to start any medication and these patients are usually started on one or two medications because these patients do have thicker cct because of which the pressures are you know inherently higher so oct again being a machine it does have limitations so the following conditions impair the performance or they will prevent the signal strength to be good like a posterior subcapsular cataract any cataracts vitromacular traction or erm dry eyes frequent bl blinking So at the end, I would like to say that artifacts can be easily overcome by knowing the art and facts of OCT, and it can be used as a clinical adjunct. And OCT provides a comprehensive optic nerve, head, and uh, retinal nerve fibular assessment to aid the clinician in early diagnosis and monitoring uh, progression of glaucoma. However, it did not replace a careful clinical evaluation, and a good uh, uh, scan. is important and should be taken by appropriately trained person and interpretation of scan should be done keeping in mind all the possible artifacts and should be clinically correlated thank you for the patient listening yes sir. wonderful presentation madam thank you sir um, see i would say first clinical history is the most important family history second as a general ophthalmologist you insist on these two things then the clinical examination then coordinate all the findings then come to the conclusion if there is no coordinating relationship you put them as a suspects and call them uh, after three months or say uh, and keep them under watch and when taking the iop you do not depend upon single iop at least you should take four to five times in different timings that gives a clue whether he is going to get a glaucoma or not number 2 single field test does not give anything repeat the field at least two times because he is undergoing a field testing for the first time so the result of the field fields may not give a good idea thank you okay uh, angmo has to go somewhere else can uh, does anybody has a pointed question for her uh, better you ask her because i may not be knowing uh, <laughs> ma'am uh, just let's say we have got many machines in the uh, for doing oct so let's say one patient has got one oct in one machine now he comes to you and now we have the different values in the other machine so act, uh, what is your take on that should we basically say that is there any progression because you are seeing it on the first time yeah that's what just so on the basically the, in, in in this is in perimetry mm -hmm. also the patient should be followed on one particular machine uh -huh. that is what we request if the patient is showing outside we say that you please show it wherever you are and i would rather go on with the clinical evaluation in that patient and not take the first scan as yes, the sir. you know uh okay. so i'll ri rather okay. like to follow up the patient thank you ma'am uh, one more question that uh, uh, with the ocd machines we normally in private sector we do the pachymetry also with that and we have seen that uh, pachymetry which we do with the oct and then we repeat it on the cirrus or pentacam there is a 10 to 15 micrometer difference in that so what do you think so, pentacam is thicker or oct uh, is thicker sir ma'am it's uh, oct that is coming more thicker as thicker, compared yeah. to the pentacam. so i also clinically have seen that i think because the tear film uh, mm. value is taken into account in the oct 
OCT which is not taken into account in pen tax so should we basically go with the thickness of the OCT or should we go with the I think you should take the pen, ba- uh, bare pen, value ha bare, bare value bare see value. you should always think that the patient is like you know have thinner corneas have rather thin, than ha go with the over. with the because Ma'am, you want any, to prevent you know the disease from progressing and last question anything which you can tell that it can be used uh, in the cases of uh, where you, we have done the um, filtering surgery or there is a tube we can basically use it to basically see the position of tube or definitely, the, uh, the of the bare balls so. anterior segment octs are uh, definitely a savior in all these complicated scenarios wherein like you don't know you we are putting tubes in the sulcus after a few months the tube retracts we don't know where it is and we want to see so you can definitely see them in the in, yes. in the octs that we are do we have new generation octs are clearly showing these thank you ma'am thank and you I, very they much they are adjunct to the and surgeons thank you or and the clinicians <coughs> and thank you angur now you can run away <laughs> and uh, thanks a thank lot for all these for all the explanations and thanks uh, sohan and uh, vinith for asking these very pointed and nice questions and uh, one more point she had said but i'll want to reiterate that if you have a normal rnfl so you have a green oct but the gcc is abnormal then please do a central 10-2 okay because normally in the 24-2 there are only four points in that field which are representing 30% of that area of the where 30% of the ganglion cells are lying so please the moment you feel that gcc and there is something wrong but the field is coming normal because we always just quickly do a 30-2 or 24-2 please wait do a 10-2 or if you have a 24-2 c program do that and then you'll find that there will be certain changes over there and then you suddenly wake up okay there are some changes coming up if retina is normal the abnormal retinal macular area can also give rise to this red uh, gcc so be very careful about that that is one hint that i learned pretty late that yes we have to be careful on that thank you angmo and now we have the most uh, exciting part uh, dr nayak sir i <laughs> i think he needs no introduction the president of the glaucoma society of india will tell us glaucoma medical management algorithm so i think invariably people have the maximum number of questions on this so and good afternoon friends so i am good and thankful for uh, giving me this opportunity to gs to cipla and the uh, sports and uh, the one of the thing that i am sure everyone must have noticed that the, when we see the prescription sometimes we really feel pity for the patient not for the for for anything else because if the don't think medicines are just putting simple eye drops because it affects a lot of things it affects the quality of life it costs money and plus the side effects so we come to this this i'll in brief i'll try to cover so for medical management first of all establish a diagnosis which very nicely covered by dr manavdeep establish a good baseline iop because the comment that he made that intraocular pressure because the baseline basically three baselines you have to 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 create first and four baselines one is intraocular pressure because with that you will judge the efficacy of your intervention the second baseline you will be forming about the perimetry the third baseline now these days because oct is structural Uh, tests are done so on oct uh, the whatever parameter you are seeing and before that the optic disc parameter so these four parameters you have to form a proper guidomes baseline then once you have done that set a target iop then initial therapy to attempt the lower iop to your target but remember that i will come in uh, sometimes later that don't just shoot the ak47 right in the beginning so everything just in one go you have to go step by step because it's not a malignant disease so if you in the process if you take even one month or two months it will not harm uh, miss that much as if as as against this when you will be putting lot of medicines in that patient side probably will be doing more harm and then follow up frequently which is a must because you have to explain lifelong follow up 
also look at the quality of life and avoid some mistakes established diagnosis i will not go in detail because really covered in quite detail good baseline again i i told already see, that intraocular pressure also consider a cct and uh, perimetry oct and optic disc but in intra because the follow up when every visit you will be doing whatever is required at that visit because perimetry oct you will not be repeating every time so in that case you have to also see that what is the purpose of doing this follow up and measuring that so intraocular pressure will tell you suppose you have um, done uh, you have added one medicine so if that medicine is supposed to produce 25 percent reduction of iop whether it is producing 25 percent means efficacy effic efficacious in this patient or not that will be judged by intraocular pressure but intraocular pressure will not tell you whether whatever target pressure you have reached your target pressure also but whether it was sufficient or not so whether you have to bring it down still further that will be intraocular pressure will not tell you that will be judged by the other parameters that you are uh, following up the perimetry oct and disc evaluation so these two follow up means or the different thing that you are going to examine every time will give you different um, uh, means a hint to you that what way you have to modify the treatment then set a target iop for this means there are many formula so many things so you have to just keep in mind you have to set a target and uh, the target pressure should be your initial goal and the target pressure is the definition wise that pressure which is supposed to stop the progression or reduce the progression to your desired level without affecting quality of life or the uh, means a reasonable affection of quality of life but it is not a single figure means don't think that it is 21 18 19 it is a basically range so in that range of course the the bottom one will be the most desirable but it is not always easy to attain that and with treatment what you do the normal curve of the 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 means normally also there is always some decay of the nerve fiber layer but that normal in glaucoma it becomes enhanced if you see the curve which is going down the yellow one so wherever you initiate your treatment your aim will be just to make it at least parallel to your to the normal aging process if you can attain that not easy to attain that so that you can maintain the useful vision for some long time and uh, these things are basic principles of target iop higher the pressure you can keep little high if the longevity is more then of course you have to keep little lower because the patient has to uh, Uh, I mean, survive for long and live for long, and if the pressure where the the if the advanced stage of glaucoma, probably you'll be keeping much lower target pressure. But the target pressure you have to always keep on re-evaluating because it's not that today whatever you have fixed is always remain the same. So you have to also change the target pressure whenever. But to attain the target pressure, the least amount of medication to achieve the therapeutic response is used therapeutic and, and because if you put instead of one medicine if you give three medicine definitely it will uh, it will produce more result but whether it's really required or not so in the beginning if you put up start with three medicines and usually i have seen prescriptions that they start one with combination and then one more medicine because the all those um, people the, the representatives who come and meet the doctors say doctor there is a new medicine and i am surprised sometimes the third and fourth line of medicine are started in the first go which is not correct so it has to be uh, means graded approach and the target pressure will be different for different persons and these are various form means rough guideline like american society says early stage 20% 30% and advanced stage 40% and with additional risk factor you go on adding some more now the selection of drug how will you suppose you are thinking because you have got three options one is the medicine second one is laser treatment and third one is some surgery so 
everyone, I mean, if it is angle closure glaucoma, definitely you will think of doing laser treatment first. But otherwise, the medical treatment usually given at first trial. So with that, how do you select a drug? So always remember there are certain drugs which are first line of drugs. There are certain drugs which are not first line. So you start with the first line of drugs because that has got least side effects and maximum efficacy. So you have to select the medicine based on the patients, what type of patients you are dealing with, whether the target will be achieved or not, what is the efficacy, the compliance you have to consider, the safety of those drops and the persistence and on top of it also affordability. When, because Harsh will agree with me, when Zolotan drop was introduced in late 90s, that time in India the medicine was costing no, 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 sir, late 90. Harsh? It doesn't matter. I think that, that is irrelevant. I say, okay, that is irrelevant. <laughs> so, that time, the drug, the price of the drug was 3 ml bottle and it was costing 1800 rupees. <laughs> so, remember, 25 years back or 28 years back, 1800 had got how much value? So, how many people, how many of us, even even uh, even the doctors also could have, uh, could afford that type of high price? Then we have to select the patient affordability in which car he is coming from. We were trading. That we have to do even today. There are people who can't even afford 300. So, we have no, to No, so then yeah. for that you have, to, you have to keep a video camera outside. So, you see, this patient got down from which car? <laughs> So, whatever you select means usually on those basis. So, I prefer to give it means unless there is some other uh, compelling reason, I usually try to start only when just therapeutic trial in one, which everyone may not agree with that. And uh, so, give that medicine in one eye and then call it after some time. Some time is after a couple of days and then see how much uh, reduction of intraocular pressure has been achieved. If it is uh, based on the response, you can decide whether you have to continue or you have to uh, start on the other eye also or whether you have to discontinue. The first line of medications are usually prostaglandin analogs and beta blockers. This is a huge list which I will not go in. But some points you should remember that avoid beta blockers in asthma, heart attack, heart block and COPD. Avoid PGA in inflammatory glaucoma, history of herpetic keratitis, CME. Avoid topical CAI, CAI in poor endothelial status and alpha-2 agonist in infants and patients using MAO inhibitors and especially in old age also because the patient old age they feel very sleepy and sometimes they can fall because of that. Follow up, I said these are the th things that you will be following up and also I told you the purpose of that because that will basic, your, your basic purpose is to maintain the function and maintain the structure. The quality of life we never consider but quality of life also has to be considered because the, the type of drug that you are using, the type of, type of routine that the patient is having, the lifestyle the patient is having and suppose a labor class and you tell them to put medicine three times or four times a day, three times a day do you think the, the, child, the patient will be able to do that? So, you have to consider the patient who is sitting in front of you. Also, always, always talk to the patient because it, glaucoma is a, you know, the patient cannot realize the benefit of treatment. Because you will say, I am very happy, your pressure is controlled and I am very happy, your glaucoma is controlled. When you say, doctor, I was seeing the same earlier, now also I am seeing the same. So, what way it is different? So, it's very difficult for them to get convinced unless you have spent time and every visit you should spend time. So, that patient remains compliant. Otherwise, you will say, every time I go, doctor is giving the same decision, continue. So, probably will, may, may not come also to you for follow-up. Because glaucoma is one of the major eye disease that causes blindness worldwide. Even more people have glaucoma without being blind or becoming blind during their lifetime. And there are various causes for quality of life because one is the various things if the because the vision, the field of vision, 
the anxiety that patient is having the medicine that you are giving so with the medicine the use of medicine plus uh, the cost of the medicine so all those things you know it becomes plus the, as i said the professional lifestyle of that patient so all this affects the quality of life so you should consider so that's why an individual approach that takes into consideration an individual patient's preferences according to his or her own risk philosophy is the best way to manage glaucoma and therefore preserve a subjective optimum quality of life because why i said different type of personality because some patient will say doctor what will happen suppose if i don't use medicine what will happen so for 5 years nothing will happen your genuine your correct answer will be that suppose if i use medicine what will happen for 15 years you will maintain your same vision or will you will be functional absolutely perfect so i said doctor bhul jao mere ko ye 5 saal to ab kyun every time why should i keep keep on putting medicine and you are affecting my quality of life so it's a everyone's attitude is different and i always used to give example we all are doctors we all know alcohol is bad for health but you see in everyday parties everyone expects a l- lot of alcohol to be served so so are you sure about that statement hmm? are you sure about that statement which one a very critical statement you are making <laughs> please withdraw that acha <laughs> चलिए विड्रॉ कर लिया जब चेयरमैन इज टेलिंग मी देन आई हैव टू विड्रॉ ओके नाउ दिस 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 एल्गोरिदम इफ यू फॉलो प्रोबली विल नॉट बी ओवर ट्रीटिंग एनी पेशेंट विथ मेडिकेशन एंड दिस इज द यूरोपियन ग्लोकोमा सोसाइटी गाइडलाइंस दैट ऑल वे स्टार्ट विथ मोनोथेरेपी फर्स्ट इफ इट इज इफेक्टिव ऑन इंट्रा बिकॉज देर कैन बी टू ऑल्टरनेटिव आई दर इट इज इफेक्टिव ऑन आई ओ पी और मे बी नॉन इफेक्टिव इफ इट इज इफेक्टिव then the next step will be to to see whether you have achieved target iop or not if it if you have achieved definitely continue and follow it up as you would like to if it is effective but target iop is not uh, achieved not reached then this is the time that you can add another medicine so don't add otherwise then you can add the second option can be that target iop is not that medicine is not effective on that patient in reducing pressure then there is no point of continuing this medicine and you change this medicine and try with other medicine so like this you will not be putting unnecessary medication to the patient side and that's why if you start first go the combination medicine then there are two problem will occur one is that if one is effective one is not effective you will not come to know which one is acting which is not acting and if there is some side effect or there is some uh, non tolerance of that eye drop you will not come to know again that which medicine out of the two is causing this problem so if you go like this probably you will be definitely doing some means uh, justice where you change the second medicine of no <laughs> wash out time i don't know my my views are always that wash out time probably something wrongly it has come in clinical practice because wash out wash out time is for research purposes suppose you are giving one medicine and you are now changing that medicine so in that case the result you want absolute result of that the effect second of medicine. that drop that's why you will wait for the washout period so that the effect of the previous drop is not there at all before you start the other drug so that in there it is definitely it has lot of relevance but in clinical practice do you think washout time because if it is there means today you have put medicine two days later it will be hardly any effect left over so so i don't think it is really important washout period for the clinical in the clinical practice now in spite of whatever you have done in spite of all this if you see that patients uh, in in spite of intraocular pressure control that if the field patient is still deteriorating then you check diurnal variation you check compliance you check some systemic features whether some other things which is causing this or maybe dealing with something different not only glaucoma so and uh, if everything is ruled out then you re- try to reduce the pressure further and of course some common avoidable mistakes you should try to avoid 
so prescription writing is definitely important and these days prescription writing was this this is my very favorite slide and I probably I have kept this slide for last 10 years with me and uh, the doctor who has written name is hidden so no one can recognize it but in this there are beta block uh, the, if you see there are four types of lubricants Plus also luminous in the same eye in the morning and salatan in the evening. So what is the point in giving this type of uh, dosing? And if this type of complicating comes complex prescription, if you give it to the patient, and especially remember, glaucoma patients are old aged. If they have and they must be having some other comorbidity. So how many tablets and how many other medication apart from this? Who can follow from this audience even for a week like this? And uh, I just follow the, my teacher, Professor L.P. Agrawal always used to tell us, no medication is best medication and least medication is the best alternative and above all do no harm. Now this is some of the wrong prescription again, like I have seen uh, writing abbreviations, patient don't understand this. So you have to and plus also if you have to give iotim once you will not be giving it at night so incomplete instructions abbreviations wrong timing and uh, sir five minute yeah two minutes okay now gelatin eye drops one drop in each eye twice daily sometimes i have seen even some doctors writing in three times a day old formula any tablet should be taken three times a day, like that. <laughs> Old format. Now, this Ganfort eye drops, some of the eye drops doesn't indicate, means it doesn't give any hint what are the constituents in this. So, it's a very common prescription, Dorjox, Dorjox T, uh, sorry, Ganfort, Dorjox T. So, it means beta blockers are there in both. So, so these type of prescription we should always try to avoid. Combigan, Travacom, similarly the same problem. So combine different drug with different mode of action. Do not combine drug from the same class of drug. So first combination should be from the different uh, mode of actions. Thank you very much. I think we don't have time now. So uh, we'll request Dr. Murli to clarify. Uh, in the end, uh, if we have some time left, we'll catch Dr. Nayak for that. Because I know there are too many questions on that, but uh, we have to let and Dr. Murli, he is a well-known glaucoma surgeon from Chennai, owning his own center. And he's always in the forefront, always trying newer things and newer technologies. But here he'll tell us whether drosoramide is improving the OBF in open angle glaucoma patient. And please clarify for us whether it is also brinzolamide or only this thing. Yeah. <laughs> This is a simpler session. So th thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, this nice uh, symposium in which we have the uh, president and the secretary of the GSI. So it's a real privilege and pleasure to be here. And of course, the AOC uh, in the midst of the AOC conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I think you have, so far you've been listening to diagnosis. So the disc and field and OCTs and so on. I'm going to switch gears totally. This is completely different from what you've been hearing so far. This is looking at one single drug and seeing how it's actually affecting or maybe influencing the way we can manage glaucoma. IOP elevation, major risk factor for glaucoma, we know that. Many people with glaucoma will progress despite having so-called target pressures. And very large population trials have shown the necessity of and the importance of ocular perfusion pressure and ocular blood flow alterations have been associated with glaucoma. It's not just the intraocular pressure, we all know that. And previous studies have reported that the CA inhibitor like dosolamide is probably effective in improving ocular blood flow, but there are very, very few or nil in Indian studies on the subject. So the various methods, how do you actually look at the ocular blood flow? How do you know what's happening in the back of the eye? Do you want to look at the circulation and so on? How do, there's so many methods, so many tests are available and all of them are research tools and the ones which have commonly been used are the color Doppler imaging, which looks actually at velocity and the flow is actually not measured. That's what I'm going to talk about. That's what we had the widest experience with. The, all the other machines, some of them are available. The new one to catch on is the Doppler OCT, which is popular in many countries, a lot of work is going on. But I think oximetry is another one. So many of them are not available in many centers, most centers. 
So our study looked at the normative data of the retro bulbar ocular blood flow using color Doppler imaging and also to determine the efficacy of 2% dosalamide in improving or uh, changing things in the back of the eye in an Indian setting. And uh, there were 24 healthy subjects, 19 glaucoma patients, open angle, moderate, 40 years and above. And uh, the baseline ocular blood flow was done by a qualified radiologist who looked at the uh, all colors, all participants underwent the baseline uh, CDI. And for all glaucoma patients, the baseline CDI was followed up with three, three times tazolamide eye drops only. And uh, subsequently, at the 12th week, the CDI uh, measurements were taken by the same observer in the same setting. The final measurements were done at the end of 12 weeks. And uh, the primary endpoint was the change in the color Doppler imaging parameters of the retrobal bar vessels, as well as the ocular perfusion pressure post treatment. And the secondary endpoint, of course, was the mean change in the intraocular pressure and any adverse ocular events that were observed. This is the machine, and this is how the uh, printout from uh, color Doppler imaging will look like. I think all of you are familiar with uh, printouts from the blood supply of the carotids and other arteries and vessels and so on. So this is how it looks like. You have the PSV, you have the EDV, you have the resistive index. Some of them are calculated, some of them are measured. So this is how, and this comes under the purview of the radiologist. We cannot do these tests because it comes under the PCP entity act. The machines are used for obstetric scans. So we don't venture into doing these scans yourself. Even though you may be proficient, don't do it yourself. I'm going to show you a short video clip of how some of you may not be aware of how the uh, color Doppler imaging is actually done. This is done by our radiologist, the crack radiologist we have. He is able to pick up the posterior ciliary arteries, the temporal or the nasal. He can, he can do it in a flash. Whereas most radiologists will see will be suffering and struggling to get the measurements done. And we also had Professor Alan Harris who came to us. He's the world authority on ocular blood flow. He was there with us to handhold and train us and he actually gave us the protocol for the study. So this was the, uh, basically I think the uh, audio is not there. What he is trying to tell you is that this is called the duplex mode and then you have the triplex mode and then you also have what is called as the uh, angle uh, correction for the measurement for the Doppler. So it's a very highly technical specific skill which the radiologist only can do but you can understand it over time. So I think I'll go forward a little bit to show you what exactly we are seeing. This is the probe that is placed. You can actually do it in the sitting posture, a reclining posture or the lying down posture, whichever is comfortable to the radiologist and the patient. But the same methodology must be used every time. So as you can see the measurements which are coming in there, you can see this is the ophthalmic artery, then you get the CRA, you can also get the temporal and the nasal short, short posterior ciliary vessels. Usually we get it quite, he gets it quite easily. So it should not be a problem and some of them, we, this is actually what is called, you can see the vessels there at the back, you can each identify the, the veins as well as the vessels easily and once you get that, this is actually what is called as a reversal of flow. So this happens uh, very rarely but this is actually what is called as a reversal of flow. So just to show you a few examples what I said. The patients who were included for this study were treatment naive and uh, patients more than 40 years of age, mild to moderate glaucoma, at least one eye. Patients willing for follow-up in 12 weeks, normal healthy volunteers had no ocular abnormality, normal optic disc and IOP less than 21 in both eyes. This was a normative data. We excluded secondary glaucoma, excluded severe uncontrolled uh, metabolic and cardiovascular diseases, intraocular surgeries, previous SLT, ALT and previous uh, inflammation, any steroids, any kind of systemic medication that is used to control the intraocular the blood pressure and intraocular pressure were not used. Were not the patients were not taken for the study. Very pa the patients who would not come for follow-up, we had excluded them. And of course, these are the allergy to Dazox or pregnant patients were excluded from the study. And the first uh, publication of ours actually came out in 2021, which looked at the normative data. We didn't have normative data for us to compare and say, this is what, what do we compare with? We are taking some measurements and you're saying this is normal or abnormal. So we first published a normative data of the ocular blood flow using color Doppler imaging in South India. This was in 2021. And this is a normative data. We looked at the ophthalmic artery, the CRA and the posterior ciliary artery. We looked at different age groups and uh, we of course calculated the resistive index as well. This is the normative data for South India, at least what we did in our center. And we also looked at the normative data in the same group of patients with the ocular perfusion pressure. We also looked at the resistive index and the intraocular pressure in this same population. And uh, to sum, sum up in brief about our DOSOC study, which we had uh, compared the clinical parameters between baseline and 12 weeks. You can look at all of the yellow highlighted ones. After 12 weeks of treatment with 2% dosalamide, a significant improvement in the ocular perfusion pressure, statistically significant, significant increase in the end diastolic uh, velocity in all the major arteries, especially the uh, SPCA, and also a significant reduction in the IOP after dosalamide 2% treatment. And no adverse events were reported in this very short time of 12 weeks. 
So these are the results of the ocular perfusion pressure, which we compared between normals and the glaucoma patients. This is the mean ocular perfusion pressure. The glaucoma patients significant, uh, uh, showed significantly reduced baseline uh, ocular perfusion pressure as compared to the normals. So the prevalence and progression of glaucoma is often related to low ocular perfusion pressure. And open angle glaucoma is associated with the decreased mean blood flow velocity and increased mean RI in the central lateral artery and the SPCA, short posterior ciliary vessels. Topical CAs have been proven to increase the ocular blood flow, but however, their effect on the Indian glaucoma patients has not been well studied so far. And in our study, the evidence of increased OPP and EDV with dorsalamine, the retro bulb, could be an IOP independent effect. It could be the di direct metabolic effect of the dosolomide on the blood vessels, a carbon dioxide mediated vasorelaxing effect. It could also, of course, be the blockade of the CA inhibition, inhibition in the local tissues, it increases the ocular perfusion pressure via the IOP mechanism. So, you can actually, you can, this is only a hypothesis, it's possible that the IOP lowering as well as the uh, CA inhibition with the direct metabolic effect on the blood supply has actually increased the blood flow. So we don't really know for sure which actually is the beneficial part. And uh, color Doppler imaging, mind you, has a lot of limitations and pitfalls. Cannot be interpreted as blood flow values unless the diameter of the vessel is also spe specified. Okay, CDI measurements depend on the probe position and the Doppler angle. The measurements are, have to be accurate and on the dot. The long ciliary artery is often mistaken for the short posterior vessel. So, you need to know your uh, so-called uh, how you image the uh, back of the eye. And the reproducibility between different operators is acceptable to a certain vessel or parameter, but not good for the back of the eye. So, you need to know somebody who has been trained well to look at the back of the eye. So, not everybody can look at the back of the eye and get you consistent results. So, radiologists are definitely required. Systemic diseases, blood pressure, treatment for blood pressure and patient comes in rushing, tired, anxious, give some time, let them relax for some time and then do the measurement. Don't do it immediately when they come in with borderline BPs and low BPs and so on. So, conclusions, Indian glaucoma patients have significantly a lower ocular perfusion pressure compared to healthy subjects. Topical dosolamide has def definitely induced, uh, reduces the, uh, uh, improves ocular blood uh, blood perfusion and increase in the end diastolic velocity, the most of the major retrobulbar vessels. This is the first Indian trial to evaluate the effects of dosolamide in glaucoma patients where we found there is a significant improvement in the ocular blood flow at the back of the eye. But mind you, it uh, remains to be established whether the uh, above mentioned uh, effects on the ocular blood flow at the back of the eye can be helping the patient in uh, visual field loss. Can, can it stop the visual field progression? Can it actually improve the glaucoma? It's a different question altogether. We only looked at one parameter of the blood flow. We, it's the interpretation and this is uh, something like a future study which would probably show us what actually is happening to dosolamide treated patients. It's a difficult study to do because invariably it's an adjunct. So you don't give a primary drug like dosolamide for most of our patients. This is from Alan Harris' book on ocular blood flow. You look at the number of studies which actually looked at in literature published so far about dosolamide and improving ocular blood flow. This was published in the World Glaucoma Consensus book by him, Alan Harris, the ocular blood flow and glaucoma. The entire uh, references are available in the book. And uh, the recent survey of ophthalmology has a very good uh, summary and survey of a major review of literature review on meta-analysis of topical CA inhibitors in ocular blood flow. The data suggests that dosolamide added to timolol may actually be effective in preventing progression of visual fields in addition to increasing the ocular blood flow and reducing intraocular pressure. So, we do have some data, some meta-analysis published in an international review journal which suggests that possibly there is some, some uh, uh, indication of uh, glaucoma progression being halted. So, in conclusion, the meta-analysis implies increased blood flow velocity and decreased vas vascular resistance in the retrobulbar vessels during CA inhibition. And uh, we went on to publish our data and uh, the first uh, paper which we presented during the uh, 2022 in the AOS that got, got us the um, best paper, the glaucoma, uh, DB Disha glaucoma award that time, 22. And now we have published this in the IGO. This was published last year. And I'm happy to inform you that the IGO has just informed us and we're getting an award this evening. This, this has got the IGO silver award for the best publication, best few publications in 2022. So this is the IGO publication. Thank you. And uh, what, what I would like to say in this slide is that the improving ocular blood flow in conjunction with lowering intraocular pressure is the way to go. You cannot primarily look at ocular blood flow as the only way we can treat glaucoma. So, dosolamide seems to be doing both. So, that's why that's the way we say that since dosolamide blocks the transformation of carbon dioxide to bicarbonate, it produces a dual effect of reducing, increasing carbon dioxide in the eye improves ocular blood flow and less bicarbonate in the eye leads to a reduced aqueous production, therefore lowering IOP. So, we have a dual advantage of probably doing both, but we definitely we need 
lot of studies to tell us what exactly would happen to glaucoma patients when you use dosalamide uh, in, in terms of blood flow and so on. It's a, it's a difficult test study to do. Like the one which we have done also took us about five to six years to complete. So take home message for all of you who are practicing clinicians. That's the basic theme of the General Ophthalm Symposium today is not to confuse you with uh, high high tech research and uh, color, color doppler imaging and so on. 24 hour BP monitoring does uh, have a value in terms of normal tension glaucoma and select glaucoma patients. Ocular perfusion pressure and OBO studies are useful in select patients. Don't go away the impression you need it for every glaucoma patient. CDA is an established tool but has many limitations in doing it. You can't do it in every center in your practice. The OCT angio seems to be a more recent development but is yet to be incorporated for routine clinical use for estimating these kind of blood flow parameters. The implication of ocular blood flow improvement by DOSOX in glaucoma progression is our subject for future study. We have already put out the ethics committee approval for the study and we are the study is now ongoing. It will take a couple of years for us to come out with this data. I wish to thank my uh, team, particularly uh, the support from CIPLA, unstinting support from CIPLA since 2016 when Professor Alan Harris came in and we also have people who came in wide across uh, India to participate in the first hands-on workshop on ocular blood flow imaging at Chennai in 2016. Thereafter, we have conducted many, many more workshops, similar workshops with the radiologist and we hope to take this forward. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Murli. Wonderfully summed up. I think that was nice. That last slide was very good. That what is the relevance for us? So, what about the brinzolamide question? The uh, number of studies which have looked at dosolamide and brinzolamide, there have been an overwhelming number, number of uh, literature on dosolamide. Brinzolamide, there are a couple of studies which show that brinzolamide also does help. But the CA inhibition with the ISO enzyme which the brinzolamide blocks is different from the one the uh, dosolamide does. Oh. So, which is why the uh, so people say that maybe well, what is yeah. known in literature is what we treat. There is no clear evidence that brinzolamide also helps. Probably if you feel dosolamide is not tolerated by a patient, you are probably not wrong in giving brinzolamide because the basic principle of inhibition of CA, uh, uh, carbonic uh, inhibition is, is the same. Yes, 12 weeks, sir. 12 weeks. That is a protocol designed by the uh, Indiana University. Thrice a day. It is given single drugs. It is given thrice a day. No, these were very selected patients who were followed up closely and were willing to come for follow-up. They had signed uh, consent forms and so on. I think only follow for the study purpose. Almost 100 percent yeah. follow-up. We didn't lose the patients. But he's shown that Timolol also helps. So yes. they can give uh, dots of Timolol uh, BD. So lowering intraocular pressure is the yeah. primary management of glaucoma. If you are seriously considering that ocular blood flow is an issue as far as glaucoma management is concerned, you need to keep this in the back of your mind. And if you really need to have proof from, say, further study that dosalamide has clearly shown a, 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 what do you call halting progression as compared to something else, then we'd probably be happier. So one additional advantage of the CDI is that you can get the flows. Yes. So because my better half, she's also doing the obvious study. So many patients who are having uh, hidden cardiac diseases because okay. you are getting uh, uh, aberrant vessels around the SPCA so that you can see that okay this is not a normal yes. waveform. You pick up and then so can, much in vein uh, occlusions, so diabetes, most, so much of vasculature uh, abnormalities. 15 or 20 actually. patients who are having yeah. the carotid artery blockage yes. and all that. We, whenever you are doing a CDI, you tell the radiologist to do a uh, we have to Doppler also Absolutely. request her. We do that routinely. We ask because, because it's only an extra few seconds for the seconds uh, radiologist. Look at the carotids as well and uh, they, they put it in free usually. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. I just wanted to comment basically on OCT. We should make the technology our slaves and not become the slaves of technology. And for that, See, in glaucoma, in reference to glaucoma, what we need is that we, what is the purpose of these investigations? As I told in my talk, the purpose is basically to reduce the number of glaucoma suspects because glaucoma suspect is because of the limitation of our diagnostic mortalities and our brain, our clinical assessment. So it is deficiency in that. So def that deficiency should be filled with that we need to fill with you know with the help of these investigations and not adding more and more cases to the glaucoma suspect group because we have done this we have found this mistake so now this patient becomes glaucoma suspect so we should not be adding glaucoma suspects we should be reducing the number of glaucoma suspects and make this technology our slave this is specifically more important for OCT 
I think it's a very very relevant. May I add a uh, comment? Yeah, yeah. Just yesterday, I think I was in a session in which there was a free paper session on use of AI using fundus photography in the vision centers and so on. So multiple vision centers it is run by the Arvind Hospital Pondicherry. Looking at multiple vision centers, you look take the uh, fundus picture using the camera. The uh, AI look, looks at the picture and tells you is it glaucoma, is it glaucoma suspect, or is it normal. So you have these three categories, and the specificity of that particular. Test and the particular picture which the AI they have worked on quite a lot of images. Lots of images were put into that uh, software, and it's amazing to see that it actually sort of really like your question about uh, seeing everybody by a glaucoma ophthalmologist or glaucoma specialist. You can have vision centers being using the uh, uh, simple technology take a picture, assess and exclude glaucoma. So if it is normal, then those people don't come for further evaluation. If it is abnormal or suspect, that's when they need to come in for further, and that sort of reduces the burden and maybe increases the detection rate for glaucoma. Maybe the future could be in AI. Thank you very much, everybody. I think that was wonderfully done, and I think we have clarified a lot of things. Thank you, Murli. Thank you, Dr. Nayak. Thank you, Manadeep. And thank you, Dr. Sohan and Dr. Vineet. And thank you, the audience, for being here.